Um, but then what the heck was what? They hey, thank you for your service, man. Do. That's got to be a heck of a job to be down in the submarine, man. Uh, you know, I mean, the it hunt wasn't for Red October part, makes it, it wasn't, glorious. It wasn't much of a participation on my side, Dutch Sense, to be honest. Um, it was a very peculiar enlistment, which is worthy of other conversations. I learned a lot of weird stuff about what's going on in the world from my short time in the submarine service. Uh, <laughs> but I, I wound up getting myself out technically. So um, I, I, I don't need any you, you fake claustrophobia or something, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I yeah, no. <laughs> okay, there's, I remember what a, I wanted to ask. There's a lot going on under the water that they're not telling us about. You're a thousand percent correct. Um, there was technologies that I saw in 1994 that they were apologizing to me for saying, oh, it's an old boat. We have old tech. We're so sorry. We're going to get upfitted. And that was stuff that the rest of the world didn't see for 40 fucking years. Touch screens on phones and stuff. You think Steve Jobs invented that? Come on. Mm -mm. These, these everybody out there that's loaded gets handed everything. We pay for it with our tax dollars. Our research and development goes into some program and then some buddy of some pal gets handed all the info and then they become indebted to them. And that company now uh, makes shitloads of money. And you think that the outfit that got them started can't dip into that. You think the CIA gets you all set up and then leaves you alone. <laughs> yeah. Here's your billion. I, I heard they never do that. Yeah. You, we're, we're never going to touch any, You're never going to do anything for us. <laughs> I mean, do everything for us, you mean. <laughs> so, Dutch, I wanted to bring up that uh, you made several very uh, interesting and fascinating discoveries over monitoring of these cycles, these energies, as well as the satellites and uh, sensor information feeds over the years. Uh, one being the uh, radar, the, uh, sorry, forgive me, I'm a little tired the which type of radar was it that causes the tornadoes and the toroidal spinning as well as all these energy oh, laser yeah. beam blasts uh as well oh michael you're there you go you're <laughs> oh my you. god okay okay hold on let me get this can of worms and let me open it up <laughs> we've got we've got so much that we could talk about when it comes to this i could go on for three hours this is where I got into all the trouble. This is where I got my channel shut down. This is where this was the forbidden topic, which is directed energy weapons. It was said to not exist. It was said to be a conspiracy. It was said it couldn't happen. It said it couldn't be done. And I, all right, I understand. Wait, pause for one skepticism. sec. Pause for one sec. So, because this could get us shut down, and since Zertus isn't here and Campbell uh, left, I'm going to shut down on both of his channels, and we will just be live on my two remaining channels. So, uh, I will post the link on that and fully continue uh, my aspect of it. The, the forbidden word, man. The forbidden the word. The H word. Yeah. yeah. Do not say it. It's like Baltimore, but Harp. So it now I, I'm not blaming Harp. Harp is just the go-to word that everybody talks about again. We, we Harp is the high frequency active aurora research program up in Alaska, does ionospheric research, and it can heat little pockets in the atmosphere and ionosphere up above Harp. Uh, it's not controlling your mind in Australia, and it's not fracturing the earth in Turkey. Okay, we can rule those things out for Harp, I think personally. Um, but what I found, this goes back to 2011, and I noticed this quite by accident. Um, this actually started on New Year's Eve of 2010 going into 2011. On New Year's Eve, thousands of animals fell out of the sky. Thousands of, of birds fell out of the sky in Greenbrier, BB, Arkansas. And they exploded from the inside. They were, they were cooked. They, were, um, they tried to blame it on fireworks at first. But it turns out there was no fireworks done in the area for New Year's. And this was in a rural area in Greenbrier, BB, where they're doing a lot of oil and gas drilling. So I was thinking it could have been something to do with maybe an oil and gas release, maybe some kind of toxic chemical made its way out and the birds inhaled it or something and exploded the birds, you know, burned them inside. I don't know. And 
within a couple days of that happening, of the birds falling out of the sky, and it was like 10,000 birds. It wasn't just a couple. It was whole towns were covered in birds, guys. It was a lot. And well, um, within a couple days, a series of uh, thousands of earthquakes then hit at Greenbrier, BB, Arkansas, right next to where the birds turned up dead on New Year's Eve. So I got a little suspicious or whatever, and I decided to go see if there was any weird weather in the area that could justify all the birds somehow exploding in internally and also explain the earthquakes. Maybe you could find something going on with earthquakes there. Could explain maybe a gas release from the hydrogen sulfide or something coming out of the ground that kill all the birds. So I go to the radar and I go look at Greenbrier and coming out of the area just north of Greenbrier, BB, Arkansas, right at the Nexrad radar station, the Nexrad radar station is pulsing in bright red. It looks like a giant red storm over 500 square miles. It's the whole radar pulsing in a giant ring at once instead of a beam going around instead of the rotating dish like you would see from a Nexrad radar going around. This was one giant pulse coming up from the center of the dish and going out to the perimeter of the radar station, 500 square miles in all it directions. Like giant, flower when it was going giant up. red signature yeah. looked like a storm. And uh, I made a video on it and put it out. People said I was faking it. They said I must be Photoshopping it. And I was like, what? I'm like, here's the link, dude. And they, they came back and said, oh, oh, no, no, you're not faking it. You're actually just seeing a switch between clear air mode and precipitation mode. It's nothing. And I said, no, 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 this is staying in precipitation mode the whole time. I'm sorry, it's staying in clear air mode the whole time. They're pulsing this thing, but it's going out all at once. I don't understand how this is happening because we're talking about a dish that goes around inside of the Nexrad. It's a, it's a microwave dish. Well, what I found out, long story short, within 72 hours of me making that video, a tornado formed and went and hit the center of the transmitter where the pulse came from originally. So pulse ha birds die pulse i go to check the day later and there's this pulse happening there's earthquakes happening there and then the tornado forms and hits the center of the transmitter now that happened about 1500 more times at every radar station across the entire country including hawaii and puerto rico the earthquakes wow. the animal deaths the pulses and the storm hitting the center of the pulse within 72 hours now what is going on there with the pulse I found out this has to do with tuning of the klystron, which is a very complex term. The klystron is a tube that's in there that's powering the radar. It's amping up the power, basically, from a little bit of power. They, when you read the next rad description for the weather radar, it tells you they're using seven clothing irons worth of power. What a description, right? For the housewives who are reading, I guess that's going to make sense. Seven clothing irons worth of power, power going in. And then they, quote unquote, well, they don't say that, zap it up. But the klystron zaps it up in a chamber of its own, a separate resonance chamber that increases the power up to 750 peak thousand, 750,000 watts of peak transmission power from the klystron tube. And I found a training video from the National Weather Service last month about how to tune the klystron tube and what frequencies are producing this giant pulse that I'm seeing, that I was seeing and we still see. And it turns out that the Nexrad pulses when they're tuning the klystron in megahertz, not gigahertz. Now, this matters. This ties in with harp. This is how Nexrad radar rings got the term slame harp rings. Because harp is operating 0 to 10 megahertz at the most, up to 10 megahertz, but they can go lower. Harp can go lower down in, the, in say, a single megahertz. And Nexrad is pulsing up to 19 megahertz. Different, different methods for tuning the klystron, depending on which tube you get from who makes the tube. Apparently, there's different levels, and it's like 17 megahertz or 19 megahertz. And in the training video, it goes over right down to the very fine point. And in the training video, they say their goal is to create the most output. The, the, it, the guy starts out in the Nas National Weather Service training video. The goal is to achieve the peak power output of 750,000 watts. So what they're doing is they're pulsing. The big pulse, not the beam, but just a big, huge red pulse, is high frequency pulsing and they're turning the dish all the way up to its highest tilt instead of pointing out like this going around and around or like this you know it tilted mm -hmm. as high as they can get it to get it out as far as it can reach and the whole dish turns into a high frequency antenna when the klystron is put into its calibration phase how to calibrate the klystron 
And what happens is the, the next rad dish is as wide as a high frequency antenna would be in your backyard. If you're doing high frequency, a 19 megahertz uh, transmission in your backyard with a shortwave radio, but it's 750,000 Watts and it vibrates. And I found, and this is my own findings on harp. They found that this isn't my findings. I mean, I found the findings from harp where they found that the resonance vibrates back and forth for up to three days from harp up in Alaska with a billion Watts. So this is more like a million Watts. So it's a million times less powerful than harp, but the next rad radar only has to cover a few hundred square miles around the transmitter where the next one picks up and it turns out they overlap the stations perfectly. And then we can get into Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden and scalar and what happens when you cross beams and yep. scalar. Yeah. Yeah. Scalar. When we get into uh, CERN, CERN's doing scalar. CERN is CERN over in Switzerland is taking banks of these klystrons and they'll take a small particle of iron that they strip off like you do with your uh, monoatomic gold, they will strip off a particle of iron. A company does this for them and presents it to them already. They don't do this at CERN. They get, yeah, they get basically a version of that, but it's in a powder form. And they shoot a small, tiny particle of iron or whatever using microwaves. Banks of klystrons, hundreds of klystrons hooked up in daisy chain to one another where they put in a little power and out the other end comes picowatts which is insane amount of energy. And then they have two banks of these. One beam goes one way around Klystron, or the Klystron beam goes one way around CERN this way. The other beam is going this way and they collide. And where they collide, that's the scalar. And they call it the scalar Higgs boson that they're studying, where they collide the beams and shoot particles together. Same thing's done with the next rad, but it's over a vast distance and it's only a million watts. So it creates a tornado instead of ripping the earth apart. Yeah, they use electromagnetic resonance when they're doing that. Those cross yeah, frequencies are like kilometers. Look for this, guys. Look for the radar stations to go into pulse mode. You, all you have to do is look at the non-quality control feed from the next rad. And they, they censor these out, by the way. They take out the pulses so you don't see them because they call them anomalies. Quality control, they call it. I'm sorry. Quality control. Got to take it out. But if you look for the pulse... Watch for the storm to hit within 72 hours. Hail, severe wind, damaging. Um, the Weldon Springs next rad radar here in St. Louis has been wind hit 100 times since I've been watching. 105. And the tornado forms and hits the center of the transmitter in the National Weather Service office when they don't misdirect it. And they can totally control it now. So they can stop the tornado as much as they can start it. But do they? No, usually don't. I've seen that they let it hit the National Weather Service office because they don't want to admit that they're causing the rotation to begin with to come into the center of the rotating transmitter that's transmitting 750,000 watts. Anyway, that's called heart rings. Because I that big trouble talking wouldn't about. be a conspiracy anymore. <laughs> Guess who manages and the next round? It's why you will always... The U.S. Army. U.S. Army replaces all the components in your next rad and the U.S. Air Force. At the Air Force Base, it's the Air Force guys. But it's the military. They maintain all the next rads across the country. Because it's part of the WSR-88, Ronald Reagan's missile defense system from 1988, when they rolled out the next rad radar in 88. It wasn't just coincidence. It's freaking Ronald Reagan missile defense, baby. We're shooting down that stuff as fast as we can with the scaler. And so... Have you considered you were observed yeah, anyway. directed energy weapons warfare? The DWO. The, the, the Direct Energy Weapons Warfare Office, right? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, I'm saying uh, what what you witnessed. Have you considered that you were simply observing directed energy weapons warfare? Oh yeah, definitely. It, it could even be that our radar it, stations. It's a, it's a are battle. Being, That's what's. It, they're fighting each other. There's people fighting each be, other with could, directed energy weapons. There could be uh, a yeah. third party up above punking our radar. I've I've proposed this that it might not be us causing the tornado to come to our transmitter at all. That it could be either from an outside source or even on the ground, somebody punking our radar, giving it too much energy in the electromagnetic field, doing the same thing, but from a, a, like hitting our radar with it, and then that causes a tornado to form, and it comes in and hits us. It could be that too, yeah. It well, definitely could be. It could also be the, in space. I'm, yeah. I'm obligated to inform you because of the dates that you threw out there and your question. You threw out that it was 
you said December to January 2010 to 2011, correct? I was at the South Pole Station and we were commissioning the Ice Cube Neutrino Detector from construction to operations and maintenance. We, we, if you check the dates for Christchurch and the earthquakes that happened then, we did that. You're talking about these systems. This is what I'm disclosing. The Ice Cube Neutrino Detector also transmits. It is the world's largest phased array transmitter. It is a directed energy weapons system. My crew caused the earthquakes in Christchurch because it was the first time they were firing it and they were attempting to do something and they messed up. So they corrected fire. I don't doubt that the systems that you're talking about weren't hot and ready for us to do what we had to do. I'm certain everybody in that environment was paying attention to everything to get it dialed in correctly. If wow. Bernie wants to go to my website in the archive section, he can pull up my DOM document, which is my evidence from the university, basically the, the manufacturer's specifications for the Ice Cube Neutrino detector state that each of the 5,160 right DOMs now, so each one of those DOMs can transmit so, uh, uh, at up to 2,047 not... volts AC. I, I'm mind, I'm sitting here, I'm breaking out wow. in a slight sweat. Hold on. I'm Ooh. trying to find people that understand what I'm saying, but most people I talk to about this. I, I know. I, this man right here totally understands what you're saying. Wow. So, uh, Eric, you're talking you massive in a private feet chat feet to your feet. website. Oh, I'm get full screen to, uh, somehow. Pull this up. Did I click a button? I must have clicked a button. I think I'm full screen. No, I did. I highlighted you. Oh, okay, okay. I'm like having a mind blowing moment here. Like he's telling me, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> like, like re amazing. Wow. So what you're saying is, is that's mass scale interferometry directed. I, I imagine I'm not as technical, but I gather I can extrapolate what you're getting at. Yes, they can basically take a signal and like move it around, increase it, do it direct. Yeah. Um, wow. But re okay. but regardless, regardless. Um, just like we know from Tesla and scalar waves, I mean, once you turn this thing on, it, it impacts the entire planet instantly if they want to do that. I mean, that's the other thing about directed energy weapons is that we have to really rearrange how our minds work. We can temporarily, we think about a weapon like a gun with a bullet in it and a particular caliber. And we're like, oh, it's a gun. What bullet does it shoot? Well, directed energy weapons aren't limited to a bullet. They can do all kinds of things. Yep. They can change your guys. We uh, have to have a whole show just tape. on this. I, I think we should do a whole show just on this topic at some point very soon. Here, sure. I mean, like, because I can, oh, yeah, yeah, it was Jeremiah and uh, Jeremy Reese, the alien scientist. Uh, this is exactly the technical group of we will have the uber mm. nerd out of nerd outs that uh <laughs> connects all these great minds that understand these things and that have been working on it and experiencing it and documenting it all and bring it together. 